Hi, my name is Imogen, and today I'm going to be talking about A Little Sacrifice by Andrzej Sapkowski. It's one of my favorite short stories, and I'm really excited to talk about it today. So I wanted to start off with just some like basic publication information. Um, so this was published in 1992, which is the same year I was born. So it's as old as me. So this is the fourth short story in the second book of the Witcher series, The Sword of Destiny. But this short story, A Little Sacrifice, was actually my introduction to the Witcher series. And now I'm on, I think, like book six. So don't give any spoilers in the comments beyond that, please. So when I first read the short story, I actually listened to it on Audible and the audiobook is so good. Like, I wanted to really highly recommend that just to start with, because there are certain parts where Geralt has to speak in, like, the mermaid tongue, and he has to sing everything that he speaks, and it's hilarious because he has a really bad singing voice. So initially, I'm not going to go into spoilers at all. I just want to go into, like, the basic summary of the story and kind of an introduction to it, especially since it hasn't been adapted into the Netflix series yet. So I thought it'd be cool to kind of encourage people to read the short story on their own because it is so so beautifully written and so good that I don't even know if it can be conveyed as well on the screen and I think everybody should have the opportunity to read it first. Um, so I'll let you guys know obviously when I'm going to go into spoilers and then for those of you who haven't read the book I'll encourage you to you know skadoodle at that point. So the main character in the story is obviously the Witcher, Geralt of Rivia. And for those of you who don't know, a Witcher is basically a monster hunter in this kind of like medieval-esque world. Um, it's a really dirty and gritty job and he has to do things that a lot of other people don't know how to or don't want to do. Dandelion is Geralt's troubadour companion. Um, you might also know him as Gaskier from the Netflix adaptation and also that's the original name in Polish but it also has kind of like a silly meaning like that. So they translated it to Dandelion. He's great. I think this is a fantastic story where he really shines as a character. He definitely subverts any ideas of him being the comedic relief. Um, he's, he just shines. I think he does great in this short story without saying much more. And I would say the third most important character in this short story would be Essie Davin. Um, she's Geralt's kind of like potential love interest. She's a friend of Dandelion's and also a musician. She's impetuous, she's feisty, she's intelligent, she's great. Sheenats and Aglaval are two characters that were introduced to really early on in the story as they're having love issues. I actually told my husband that this kind of reminds me of 90 Day Fiance um, because Sheenats is a mermaid and Aglaval is a duke on land and they want to be together and they kind of are talking about the furtherance of their relationship but neither is willing to make a sacrifice. I feel oh my heart cracked. To, you know, go into the other person's world. They're talking about having kids and all this stuff and it's just kind of that, like, drama. They have a translator, like Geralt is translating because they don't even speak the same language, so that's why it just reminds me of 90 Day Fiancé in a weird way. Um, but it's kind of mixed with Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, which um, I'm pretty sure was an inspiration for this short story. And that whole tension between them and trying to figure out who is willing to make the sacrifices is the first, you know, nod at the, you know, title of the short story, which is A Little Sacrifice. All of the characters make their own sacrifices in the story, which is great, because the story starts off with both Dandelion and Geralt having to take jobs that they kind of feel is beneath them because they're having money problems. I have a quote here from Geralt talking to Dandelion saying, don't put on airs, we need the few pennies. And he's saying that because Dandelion doesn't want to take a job to work a wedding where he's, you know, second to Essie Davin, where he's performing with her. He kind of wants to be like the solo star. And Geralt doesn't want to work with Aglaval, the Duke, who is kind of a huge jerk. To conclude the non-spoilery part of this review, I just wanted to say that Andrzej Sapkowski is an amazing author. He brings so much humor into the story, but also so much heartache. There are parts where you will probably, if you have my sense of humor, laugh out loud, because I know I did, um, but then other parts where I left feeling, I was left feeling totally gutted. And I think it's a testament to how talented the author is. So I highly recommend you check it out and read it first. But for those of you who have read it, we're going to do a little more of an in-depth analysis of it. So as I previously mentioned, I really loved this book on Audible. I thought it was a really fun read. And if you're interested in reading it too, if you click the link in the description down below, there's actually a link to a free audiobook. So you can do this one, Sword of Destiny, or its predecessor as it's not the first book of the Witcher series. And I highly recommend it.
One great thing about the short story is Dandelion's character development. He's willing to make sacrifices to hang out with Geralt and to travel with him. Um, not only just for the stories that he gets from Geralt, but because he truly loves Geralt as a friend. And he loves all his friends, as we see with Essie too. He genuinely thinks that them being together would be better for their happiness. You know, obviously he supports Geralt being with Essie over with Yennefer, who he clearly views as pretty toxic. And I think that this short story just does a great job as, as you know, elevating him from the, you know, comic relief character. He shows that he's intelligent, he's shrewd, he's a beautifully talented musician. I have this quote here where it says that Dandelion saw through him effortlessly and unerringly, and it just shows how well he knows Geralt after their times traveling together. I think even though he sees the darker sides of the world or how things don't always work out the way that you had imagined and it hurts him, he chooses to turn it into something beautiful like humor or like music. And, you know, I think that shows strength of character. Speaking of the harsh world that they live in, I think Andrzej Sapkowski does a great job of world building in this story. I think it's so interesting that the humans know very little about the ocean and it's kind of like the new exploration for them. And even Geralt seems to be intimidated by, you know, what lies beneath. I have a quote here that says, Witcher's abilities are insufficient against sea monsters. So Geralt is not sure if he's going to be able to you know, conquer this thing that's, you know, killing people from the depths. But he is willing to make a sacrifice and try because he and Dandelion really need the money. And I think also the fact that Geralt's kind of the one sent into the front line, so to speak, um, is interesting as well. You know, people's, you know, livelihood is cut off when they can't go into the ocean in this town. That's where they get their resources, their pearls, their fish to eat. And they're all afraid, you know, that like what's going to happen if they can't fish. So of course they rely on the Witcher, who they also kind of seem to detest. It's a really dirty job and Geralt doesn't get the appreciation that he deserves, which is similar to certain jobs that a lot of people have that we rely on today. And I think the way that society views the Witcher's job is revealed in Aglaval's words. He's the duke that hired the Witcher and who's in love with Sheenoths. He says, what are witchers for if not so that decent folk don't have to rack their brains about how to rid themselves of monsters? I've hired you to do a job and I demand you carry it out. If not, get out of here before I drive you to the borders of my realm with a whip." It shows a total lack of appreciation for Geralt literally risking his life to help his livelihood. Um, which is such a human thing to do, and I think that that's a, a great element that Andrzej Sapkowski brings out of these stories is that humans are still the same even if there's monsters or magic or anything going on in the world. Essie Dobbin is a fantastic character. She is strong in the places where some people would consider her to be weak. Um, she is proud and intelligent and speaks up when she sees wrong being done. And I just think overall she is not just kind of like a Bond girl on the side or something like that. Like she's a character that you kind of fall in love with, you know, only after reading about her for a short period of time. I think that the way that she loves Geralt, even though she knows she's not going to receive the same love that she wants back, shows such courage. I think that one really tragic and poetically written part of this story is how she basically dies in a way that she thought would be the absolute worst option for her before she met Geralt. Here she, she compares her love for Geralt to being an infirmity like malaria, like being unable to breathe. And yet she mentions, you know, later that her greatest fear is always being powerless. Um, she was always afraid of illness, of being weak, helpless, hopeless, and alone. I've always been afraid of sickness, always believing it the worst thing that could possibly befall me. But yet we know at the end of the story that is exactly how she dies, of an illness. But at that point, she's kind of learned that that's not the worst thing that can happen to her. In spite of being a poet that writes about the beauty of love in her ballads, she expresses here that she didn't really understand it until she experienced it. She didn't understand that her love could be also mixed with humility and, you know, the feeling of being ashamed. And even though the love that she had for Geralt, you know, resulted negatively, and caused her pain, she really treasured the fact that she was able to feel that. To the point that she kept, you know, the, the pearl that Geralt had given her until her dying day. It's just such a beautifully written character, and it really comes around full circle at the end. And as for Geralt, his feelings for her, I think, are very conflicted. 
I think that he has feelings for her, but he's confused by them because he didn't think that he could experience those. Whereas like when I talked to my husband, he felt like he didn't think that Geralt really, like he cared for her, but not that he loved her back. And I think that that's kind of interesting that it's never clearly defined exactly how he feels for her. But I think that we learn a great deal about his character through the way that he, you know, approaches and reacts to these feelings. Previously, you know, in the book, he says, I am an unfeeling witcher. I think he didn't think that he had the capacity to care for someone other than Yennefer. And that surprises him and really catches him off guard. We've seen him in romantic relationships before, but they're not so sentimental. And I think the fact that he leaves so much unsaid, um, even though he's kind of a taciturn guy in general, um, it just shows how conflicted he is in his approach towards Essie. I think that this is an interesting time for Geralt to experience this relationship in regards to us learning about him. Because up until this point, we've heard a lot about Yennefer, but we haven't fully ever seen him and Yennefer functioning as a couple together. Whereas with Essie, you kind of get a glimpse at what a non-toxic relationship could have been like. Like, you could tell that they just worked really well together, and even she and said that they complemented each other so well. And there could have been love there if it were not for the fact that he had simply met Yennefer first. It was love, but it was just at an inconvenient timing. And we see Geralt express this in this quote here. He says, Why? It doesn't matter. Because Essie smells of verbena, not lilac and gooseberry. Doesn't have cool, electrifying skin. Essie's hair is not a black tornado of gleaming curls. Essie's eyes are gorgeous, soft, and warm, and cornflower blue. They do not blaze with a cold, unemotional, deep violet. Essie will fall asleep afterwards, turn her head away, open her mouth slightly. Essie will not smile in triumph. For Essie, Essie is not Yennefer. And he basically says that's why he cannot find in himself a little sacrifice for her. So this story does a great job of showing that Geralt isn't as limited by his mutations as he thought. He is surprised by these feelings that he wasn't anticipating having. And another point that I think is really interesting about the story is that even though we kind of, like, I don't think anybody likes Aglaval throughout the entire story, he's the one that gets the happy ending. And I think that's interesting because it shows that love is not limited to the good people. You can see the villainous guy still fall head over heels in love. That has nothing to do with what kind of person you are. It's just something that happens. Andrzej Sapkowski is so great at writing romance because he leaves so much unsaid. And I think it's in the mysteries that each relationship that he creates holds that allow the reader to kind of understand it without needing to fully understand everything because you can feel more when everything isn't absolutely spelled out for you. And I think that is kind of how relationships work. Two people can fall in love and whether it works out or not, nobody else besides the two of them know what that experience was like for each of them individually. There are really great lines that convey this in just such subtle ways. It says about Essie, she sat down reluctantly, tactfully, far away, too close. I think you can kind of feel that tension with just those simple, you know, two word sentences. Um, you really, you can really feel that. Whereas if he tried to explain it in, in much more detail, it would almost ruin it. It's that simplicity. And he does such a great job, especially, you know, with Essie and Geralt's last moments together, where it says that they, you know, talked together for a long time, but it doesn't tell us what they talked about. And it says that they, were intimate, but it doesn't go into some raunchy detail. And it's just kind of beautiful because the moment, even though they're not real characters, the moment is just for them. And that's how love should be. He also does a great job at describing music. In the last truly heartbreaking scene where Dandelion is playing the ballad that he wrote about Essie and Geralt, where he lies and said that they ended up together, even though he knows that Essie ended up dying alone of smallpox with you know, the, the pearl that Geralt gave her around her neck and he carried her off and buried her. It shows again that Dandelion isn't naive. He sees the darkness in the world and chooses to focus on the light, which shows that he's a fantastic character. And he writes a story about how they were, you know, in love forever and not even death could separate them. And the way that the song is written is just so incredibly beautiful. It began with a few bars from which an elegant, soothing melody emerged. The lyrics suited the melody, 
and came into being simultaneously with it, the words blending into music becoming set in it like insects in translucent golden lumps of amber. And he never sang it, never, to no one. And the thought of we're kind of getting this glimpse, in, even though we're not hearing the song, into this beautiful melody that he only played to a werewolf <laughs> that heard it. Sapkowski is so great at creating these intimate moments where when you're reading this or listening to this, it's just the room gets quiet and your heart kind of slows down and you're, you're, just, it, you're just gutted. You're just completely gutted. And then the fact that the song was so beautiful that there is a werewolf, um, it describes him as hungry and vicious. Dandelion's song calms his rage and he just listens. So this is just such a beautiful, beautiful emotional story that is everything that you would want in a good story. It has like monsters and humor and love and heartbreak. And it's just great. And I, I'm, I'm honestly worried about it being adapted to Netflix. It hasn't been adapted yet, but I'm just worried because it's such an intimate story and because of some of my opinions on how some of the other short stories that Sapkowski did were, you know, kind of portrayed on the big screen. I'm just a bit concerned about that. And I wanted to know your thoughts. Do you think that this, this story could make a good episode in the Witcher series or not? So let me know in the comments and, you know, like, subscribe. Don't forget to check out my Instagram account. I'll link it down below and have a lovely night.